everyone, I'm Rebecca and welcome back to my sewing room. Today I want to talk about Regency fashion and specifically how to wear Regency styles as a plus size woman. But first, a big thank you to my Patreon patrons who make videos like this possible, especially the patrons in my romantic and Victorian tiers, Alexia and Sarah and Grace. So thank you all so much. If you would also like to become a patron, there is a link to my Patreon down in the description below. Now, on to my tips for Regency fashion. Naturally, my number one tip is just wear Regency fashion. <laughs> but obviously, I want to make sure that you feel comfortable wearing it and that you feel like you're wearing something that is flattering on you. Because let's be honest, sometimes Regency can feel a little unapproachable with its columnar look, slimmer skirts, and a relative lack of skirt supports. If you're like me, you might generally feel more comfortable in eras with a little bit more to them. But it is totally possible to feel and look quite lovely in Regency fashion, no matter what size you are. So today, we're going to go a little more in depth on some tips and tricks I have discovered to feel beautiful in the Regency era. Now, I do want to preface this by saying that I am not a Regency expert. I can generally tell if something is early Regency, middle Regency, or late Regency by looking at it, but I can't pinpoint it within a couple of years like I can with most of the Victorian era. So most of these will be general tips that you can apply to all of the Regency era. I guess on that note, I do want to give a quick breakdown so that we're on the same plane here. Early Regency is generally thought of as the 1790s. This era had a lower, fuller bust and fuller skirts, generally made out of very flowy fabrics. This is a transitional era, and as such, you can kind of still see a lot of the 1780s within these fashions, just with an ampere waist. Hair was large and curly, but natural looking, and stays in this period were transitional, kind of a shortened version of 18th century stays, but with bust cups. What I call middle Regency has moved from that very soft, full look into a much more slim look, plainer, straighter dresses that were often made out of very light and drapey fabrics. Think of your standard Jane Austen adaptation costumes. Hair was worn up and much closer to the head with soft curls around the forehead and headwear was likewise smaller. The support garment had turned into what we think of as Regency stays or corsets, which could be either the short style that just supported the bust but didn't cover the tummy, or the longer ones which went down to the hips. And then there's late Regency, which is my personal favorite, mostly because you can see the style evolution from here to the 30s pretty easily, and I love the 30s, but... In the late 18 teens through 20s, skirts started to get a little shorter, and the hems were often stiffened and adorned with lots of trims. The skirts were still relatively slim, but a little fuller than earlier in the period. Likewise, you see a lot more adornment on sleeves and bodices, and the waist actually starts to move downwards a bit. The hairstyles, though still close to the head, start to grow upwards as the years get later, with larger headwear to match. I'm not sure when the short corset fully disappears from fashion, but I believe that as the waistlines get a little lower, most women wound up adopting the long line corsets that were favored more by larger women earlier in the period. Okay, so now that we've done a little overview, let me talk about some of my favorite Regency fitting tips. Keep in mind, again, that when I dress Regency, I am not usually going for a specific year's style, so I do tend to pick and choose the most flattering bits and combine them into one outfit. Mostly this means that I err a little bit on the side of the 1820s. In fact, a little side note, the only decade I am missing from my costuming wardrobe from the 1760s through the 19 teens is in fact the 1790s, and I may wind up remedying that this year if I have time. As such, the focus of this video is really going to be on the middle and later Regency styles. Let's start with the underlayers. I made this Regency corset back in 2012 or 2013, and it's made from a pattern diagram in period costume for stage and screen. It's a long line style corset made of cotton twill, the older, thicker stuff Joann's used to sell, not the very thin stuff they have now. It's boned in just a few places with steel boning, and also uses cording for stiffener and support. It's very comfortable and does a great job of smoothing everything out and supporting the bust. The long line corset is so important for plus size women because it contains your torso quite nicely and lifts and separates the bust, creating a sort of shelf bust. 
Because the waistline of dresses should hit fully below the bust, cough, Bridgerton, cough, this corset shape allows for a nice slim line with lots of definition between bust and ribcage or waist. If you want to make your own corset from a pattern, I have heard good things about Red Threaded's Regency corset pattern, and many other pattern makers also have them as well. Red Threaded also carries ready-made Regency corsets if you would rather purchase this layer. Underneath my corset, I'm wearing a cotton chemise or shift made of muslin. It's a short sleeve style with a scooped neck that has a drawstring in it. The chemise is very important, as besides keeping your corset and clothing clean, it's what holds your bust in place within the corset. I also wear costume style bloomers with all of my costumes, which prevents chub rub, but really drawers were not commonly worn in the Regency period. Over the corset, I wear a petticoat. There are two types of petticoats that were common in the Regency era. One style is like this, which has straps that go over the shoulders and otherwise just ties with a drawstring around the waist. And the other kind is called a bodiced petticoat, which uses a Regency style bodice up top instead of straps. Whatever you choose is just a matter of personal preference, but you do want some kind of shoulder strap since otherwise your petticoat will almost certainly not stay up right below the bust. I did not use a pattern for my petticoat, as it is literally a rectangle of fabric gathered slightly and bound in tape with twill tape straps. I did do tucks around my hem to help with shaping, which I recommend since it helps to keep your skirts from getting wrapped around your legs. In the Regency era, by the way, undergarments, including the corset, were almost always white because the dress fabrics, particularly for day wear, were usually quite thin. White fabrics are also easier to clean. That said, you do sometimes see colored petticoats if they were meant to be seen through the outer dress fabrics, but they tended to be the bodice style so that you would see them all over. Now, let's talk about dresses, both styles and patterns. For patterns, I have found that I really like Laughing Moon. Their patterns are done well, are fairly size inclusive, as in they go up to a 56 inch bust and a 48 inch waist, and their instructions are fantastic. I have used pattern number 137 for Police's and Spencer's, and pattern 138 for back closing gowns from them, and both worked very well. They also have patterns for a Regency corset, bodiced petticoat, bib front gown, wrap front gown, and others, plus non-Regency patterns, so I would definitely recommend checking them out. I have linked their shop page in the description. I'm going to mention some of the changes that I generally like to make to Regency patterns in order to make them more flattering, specifically changes that I've made to Laughing Moon 138, but that can be applied to pretty much any Regency pattern out there. First, I like a waistband. And as I mentioned before, that waistband should be hitting fully below the bust and snug around your ribcage. I find it more flattering to have that little bit of separation between the bust and the skirts, so I like adding even just a one inch wide waistband below the bust and attaching the skirts from there. This was very common in the later Regency period, but not as common before then. You can pipe the edges of the waistband for added pizzazz. <laughs> If you're doing a bib front style gown, a built-in waistband is a little bit more difficult, but you could add a sort of waist tie look, even if it's just a ribbon, that goes along the bottom of your bib and then ties around you in back, which is a very cute look and will still act as that sort of defining waistband. Also, I like skirts that are very slightly gathered in front. I mentioned this in my plus size costuming tips video a couple weeks ago, which I have linked up above and down below in the description, but I find that it's more flattering if I have just a little bit of extra skirt fabric to play with in front. This allows for the dress to fall away from my body, even at my hips. You can do significantly more gathering in back if you choose. As for bodices, I tend to find that the style that is gathered into the neckline and the waist in front is the most flattering, as opposed to darts, which can look very pointy in this era because of how short they have to be. I also tend to prefer a lower neckline, especially if it's an evening gown or if it's something that's going to be worn with an underblouse or chemisette. A higher neckline generally feels like it's cutting me off a bit and lower necklines tended to be more common in the Regency period anyway. Just make sure that it's high enough that it's not gaping, you're comfortable, and your chemise doesn't show. That said, if you are self-conscious about your neckline or chest area, or you're going for day wear, chemisettes are totally your friend. A Regency lady would not have gone out during the day with a low neckline, and chemisettes are a great way to frame your face and really make your outfit look more flattering. I made mine in a class at Costume College a few years ago, but you can find a couple patterns for them in Patterns of Fashion by Janet Arnold. 
For hems, if you're tall like me, don't be afraid to play around with a ton of hem decoration, especially if you're going for an 1820s look. If you're on the shorter side but still want to do 20s, I would say be careful not to start your hem trim too high up your skirt as it will break up the nice long lines that those skirts give you. Don't be afraid to play around with padded hems for the 20s though, as that will give you a very nice skirt shape. Earlier in the Regency period, hems were generally left plain and were usually on the longer side, which elongates the body nicely. Sleeves can be a worrisome area for a lot of people. Some people don't like the way puffed sleeves look on them, or short sleeves at all for that matter. Luckily, there were tons of different sleeve shapes in the Regency period. You can find closer fitting sleeves that hit above the elbow or even all the way down past the wrist. You can find sleeves with little puffed heads with long sleeves underneath that. Sleeves that have gathers or ruching or slashes or puffs or leaves or any number of decorations. Ball gown sleeves were generally short, but in the 20s, there was a fashion for a short sleeve made of the dress material with a fuller sheer sleeve over the top that reached to the wrist, which is great if you feel self-conscious about your arms. Don't be afraid that there's any sort of sleeve that you can't wear. As long as you're comfortable in it, you can wear it, no matter what your arms look like. That's about it for dresses. Spencers, which are crop jackets that were so popular in this period, are another fun thing to play around with because they do such a nice job of highlighting the bust and framing the face, and you can really play with color, texture, and decoration here. Besides the day wear Spencers that most people think of, there were also evening wear Spencers, which tended to be sleeveless and worn like little cropped vests. As far as other accessories go, the one real problem area that I have found, and unfortunately I don't yet have a solution for, is gloves. It seems to be pretty much impossible to find the long gloves that they so favored for evening wear for plus size arms. If anyone has any resources for gloves that do go up several inches past the elbow and don't look like they're made of spandex or satin, please do let me know and I will add that resource to the description. Hats and bonnets, on the other hand, can be pretty easy to manage. There were so many different types of popular headwear for the Regency period. Personally, I like a slightly larger bonnet, like the style that has the little poofed back, and I like the way a larger brim frames my face. It's all about that balance. Besides the myriad of bonnet styles, you can also do turbans and caps, and for evening, feathers, combs, flowers, and tiaras. I tend to do a slightly fuller hairstyle with lots of curls and a large bun on top since I feel it helps to balance everything out nicely. Shoes are also easy to manage. Ideally, you would want a kitten heel with a bit of a pointed toe, but ballet flats work just fine. Oh, and don't forget your stockings! Sock Dreams has a lot of great stockings for larger legs, and they have fit descriptions in all of their listings. I've included the link to Sock Dreams in the description, and I highly recommend you check them out for all of your stocking needs. And that's pretty much it! I hope this helps to show that anyone can wear Regency, no matter what size or shape you are. I definitely recommend starting with that long line corset, but once you have that, you are golden. If you have any questions on anything that I covered, or anything that I left out, please leave me a comment down below, and I will try to either answer them or cover them in a future video. As this is part of my series of videos about historical costuming for plus sizes, please do leave me a comment if there's a different topic you would like me to cover in the future as well. Anyway, if you liked this video though, please be sure to click the thumbs up icon, and if you'd like to see more videos like this from me, please go ahead and click subscribe and the little bell icon to be notified every time I post a new video. I do post videos here on YouTube twice a week with my sewing vlogs on Tuesdays and other costuming content like this out on Saturdays, but I post every day over on my Instagram, so please go follow me on Instagram, that's at LadyRebeccaFashions. And if you'd like to support me and all of the work that I do on this channel, I do have a link to my Patreon and my Ko-fi accounts down below. Once again, thank you so, so much for joining me for this video. Have a wonderful week, and I will see you very soon in my next video. Happy sewing!